Welcome everyone to Growth via Massive Customer Experience Savings and Wazy Lease Expected. This is an encore presentation from my CX Leaders Advanced Workshop in Florida in May for the CXPA conference. And I was a little surprised to see how many people were interested in customer experience savings because most of the metrics we hear about are about recommendations, revenue uptick, all of that type of thing. Of course, there are some customer experience metrics that deal with savings such as first contact resolution, but we may not be thinking of that uh, specifically as savings. So what comes to mind in terms of customer experience savings? Generally, things that touch the customer. How can we make those processes more efficient? So we're looking at how to outsource customer service, uh, how to uh, make our customer service more efficient, uh, how to digitalize the entire customer journey, things like that. But I'm thinking about customer experience savings more massively than that. I'm thinking about customer experience savings in terms of permanently removing the pebbles in customer's shoes, which may include what we've just covered, but probably a lot more. So I'm going to show you a new way to think about that. And I welcome your comments. Uh, I'll leave a little time at the end to answer any questions. So uh, this is a, a quick run through of what I presented earlier. And what I really found interesting in the CXPA website about the definition of customer experience is that there's not only operational gains, but also of course, organizational gains, social gains and financial gains. And the main thing to keep in mind with all of this is taking on your CEO's mindset. When you think about how your C-suite is rewarded or um, judged by the outside world, the investor community, the board of directors, and so on. Uh, well, it's all about, are they creating sustained advantages? Are they maximizing growth, which has the double side of revenue growth and profit growth? And to do that, are they increasing speed of money in the bank? So is that cycle time getting shorter? Are they minimizing costs? so that they have more agility as an organization. This is a agile organization thinking of how quickly you can adapt to things that are happening in the market, how quickly you can be proactive and beat your competitors to uh, solutions for customers. And how are you minimizing risks? And customer experience actually has a role, a huge role in all of those care abouts that CEOs have so if we're thinking more like the CEO and the C-suite, we can take on a broader uh, idea of customer experience. Now, this actually came to a real clarity for me on my way to Florida because we were delayed by 18 hours. And I'm only coming from Arizona, for heaven's sakes. I can drive to, uh, to Florida in less than 18 hours, I believe, from Phoenix. So, um, you know, what happened was they had a part that was uh, messed up in the preceding city, Las Vegas. And when the plane came to uh, Phoenix, it was already three hours late. They put us on the plane for two hours. We sat there. Then they said, well, this part is still messed up or our maintenance or whatever. And the flight crew has their time limit. So it was all this uh, kind of a domino effect. They told us to get off the plane and go into a line. And... Uh, well, uh, we would be taking off bright and early the next morning. In total, there were like, I think, seven announcements of a new time to change because we were on the plane and in the airport for quite a long time the next morning as well. So it just got me thinking about what is the custo chief customer officer role with that type of a situation? Because sure enough, every company has those types of situations, even my own. Um, you know, nobody's perfect and uh, we all... Uh, rely on a lot of things that uh, there's moving parts. So be thinking more broadly about the customer experience. Should the chief customer officer have some say over uh, spare parts inventory and the maintenance people's certification levels so that things can be prevented? Should this chief customer officer have a more proactive instructions about uh, you know where to go and what what should be done because we didn't get anything on the app on email 
on text messaging about what our options were besides standing in a long line with 200 people. So a lot of kind of mess ups and uh, you know we're all prone to, to uh, face that in one way or another. This uh, webinar uh, inclusive of that. We'll be thinking about the flip side. All of these operational gains that we just looked at a moment ago have another side of the coin. So not only having higher loyalty and retention, but having less customer churn, right? Not only having smarter resource expansion, but and uh, more effective and efficient operations, but lo longer customer retention, lower cost of acquisition, and less negative word of mouth. So these are the flip side of the coin. I once had a supervisor who would always tell me, and when I met with him, well, Linda, what if you turned that around? And so I've gotten in the habit of that, and you might notice it in most of the things I uh, present to you or write about. When you look at the other side of the coin, a lot of times a new world is opened up. So if we are uh, looking at this like Russian dolls, peeling the onion, uh, going into what's behind that and what's behind that and what's behind that, then we're thinking about what is needed in order to get less customer churn. Either we can go out and tell the customers, please don't churn, here's an incentive, that's kind of an expensive one, way to run your business. But it's less expensive actually to reduce the demand for support. That does not mean making it hard to get support, right? Doesn't mean having people go stand in a line for two, with 200 people. It just means give the information or uh, reduce the the, uh, the issue in it, in and of itself so that there is less need for support, right? So if we had less returns, less refunds, less remedies, and fewer and shorter escalations, then obviously we would be achieving this top goal and the flip side of it as well. So let's take it down to the actual heart of the Russian doll uh, series of circles here. And we have less scrap and less and lost opportunities, shorter cycle times, fewer defects, re-engineering, um, like taking a look at the processes that are behind these things and organizing it to be a more logical process from the customer's viewpoint, more seamless and easier to manage for employees' viewpoint, uh, re-engineering your organizations, your policies and your business models to, to prevent these costs and, and uh, these consequences. So, what you have to do to get there, if we take it down one more level and see what do we really need to do? We need to instill a lifetime value mindset and a right the first time mindset among all employees across the organization. You see in the airline example, it wouldn't have been enough to just influence the right the first time mindset among the people at the gate, the people at the service desk, the pilot and flight attendants. No, we needed to, in that example, and almost everything that happens in your company as well, instill a right the first time mindset among the inventory people, the maintenance people, and so on. Now, I've shared this story with some people who uh, work as pilots and such, and they've said, well, there's so many other parts here about the uh, flight tower, you know, the uh, other planes leaving and coming and things like that. All right, I understand it's more complicated than that. But my point is when the customer experience team is thinking more broadly about influencing every group to be more preventive, then we may see less headaches like that. So of course, uh, looking at processes of all kinds, not just the ones that touch the customer, but most importantly, the ones that are at the root of the pebbles in customer's shoes. So peel and peel and peel the onion, just like these uh, Russian dolls, to get to the real heart of it. The little guy right there is the heart of it. And this means we need to relook at performance criteria. Don't just put the performance criteria at the outcomes, because it's best to make sure that you are putting performance criteria at the roots, the little guy here. 
And this actually makes it more uh, actionable and purposeful for your employees, I think. So I see that Brian has a question about customer segments. Uh, yes, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, is it also important to prioritize your customer segments to say that we're really doing well within, let's say, members of an insurance company, but then the the clients we have, certain clients we have uh, a really high turnover, so we look at them more. Is that a good strategy? Generally, if you have a problem, it's probably affecting almost all customers. Uh, so if you engage each group in doing their part to address their problems, sometimes segmentation isn't even part of the equation until later on. But in terms of where you will see the highest savings, therefore the highest ROI to report, if you want to go from quick wins to massive wins, then I would prioritize customers based on customers who care about this issue or the issues based on the, the revenue and cost of customers that are um, driving the business the most, right? So if your business in 2024 and 2025 is relying on a certain type of customer as the main growth area or a certain type of customer that is uh causing the most costs, then you might look at it those ways. So I guess in short, Brian, my rule of thumb is to be thinking about it in the way that the CFO would think about it, the way that the CMO and uh, CRO would be thinking about it. Who are we targeting? How can we make things as, as perfect as possible for who we're targeting as our primary customer segment in marketing? Because the company has decided that we need to attract those guys and we need to have magnetic retention of those guys. Therefore, you want to make sure that the experience is as perfect as possible for that group of customers so that they aren't prone to uh, switching to your competitors. When, you, when you're talking about customer experience management in the same way that your chief financial officer, your business development, marketing, and uh, salespeople are thinking about it, you'll find that you have less resistance, a lot more buy-in and a lot more support uh, organizationally because you're actually matching the rest of the company. Brian, did I answer that all right or was you thinking about it differently? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I think we do start to speak the same language with our senior management and finance. And once that happens, uh, I think it, it will take off. We're in a situation where we're developing CX as a function. And so talking the right talk and putting it in the same frame frame or lens uh, that, that as they see it will go a long way. So appreciate that. Yeah. And, and thank you for that point, because I also want to clarify that I'm not saying give a crummy experience to everyone else, not at all, or don't do anything for anyone else, such as, you know, limit your customer service and other normal stuff to just your top customer segment. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you're going to be choosing where to play, where to emphasize, what to prioritize, prioritize it the way that the, the business is prioritizing it instead of trying to be all things to all people in customer experience or kind of randomly or arbitrarily choosing a part of a journey or a customer segment or persona that seems to be handy or whatever, we need to be thinking more strategically, just like the C team thinks, how the uh, C CFO and CRO and CMO think. And if we start out aligning with them and then using some of my principles to educate them, you'll also be able to um, adjust their thinking to a more holistic customer centric viewpoint that plays off for everybody. But start there, that's a good place. Here's how you're going to be looking at the cost of that root cause, right? So you're looking at what is the prevalent issue and how much is it costing us in customer service for that issue? So for example, if a certain number of calls or inquiries come in about that issue, uh, take how much time it, it, it uh, takes to serve that or at least how many uh, what percentage that issue is of all the others and then take a look at the um, labor and fringe 
or service. You may have other things that go into customer service. Do as much as you can in terms of just making an estimate. And then how much are you paying in remedies? How much are you paying in escalation, meaning all of the time and fringe uh, benefits for the people involved in the escalation process and meetings? For example, you may have your CFO and, C and COO in some of these escalation meetings, which is quite expensive when you take a look at their hourly uh, salary and so on. And then churn costs. How much are people churning based on this prevalent issue? How much trust are you losing? Now, some of these things you may feel really uncomfortable because you're like, well, I don't really have access to those costs. I don't know all the different costs. Well, get over that because when I was in strategic planning, we were doing competitor analysis and acquisition analyses and so on with puzzle pieces, right? You, there's no way you can get the whole picture. So we found out that when we present to the board or the, the C-suite of, about an acquisition candidate or uh, whatever, we could say, here's what money we did have visibility into. Here's the source of it. And we know this is the tip of the iceberg. And of course, those executives had a lot of experience, different ones from different angles, and they could start to piece it together. But generally, what we did show them was very compelling in and of itself, even knowing that that's only one third of the picture, or maybe one tenth of the picture. When they saw those numbers, it was like, my gosh, this is amazing. You know, we want to go this way or we want to go that way. So put down what you have and label it in terms of your source and so on. So all of these would be added together to say, these are our sunk costs for this prevalent issue because it's not going away. In fact, every month and every year that we add more customers, these sunk costs may actually increase accordingly, right? Because the issue isn't going away. So what if we were to cut those costs in half and how much would it cost us to cut those costs in half? you'll really usually figure out that the cost to cut things in half is just a very, very small percentage of what this is. And it's a total no brainer to engage managers of all types, non-customer facing partners and so on who are involved in it to do their part to minimize. So this is one way of looking at how do you quantify uh, customer experience costs, uh, customer experience opportunities, because this is the cost of poor experience. It's something that is sunk because you don't have any way of, of getting out of it, even if you digitalize or off, off so, offshore or whatever. Um, it's still going to be costing you a tremendous amount, and especially in trust. This here we cannot underestimate, and it's hard to quantify, but it's important to put down a few things in there, even if they're not numbers, what are some things that you know about or issues or uh, areas that uh, are concerning with the way that customers see your company and your trust versus their other options. Now, taking this a step further, you need to be thinking about how your customer experience insights can actually influence these mindsets and actions in order to see less scrap, shorter cycle time, fewer defects, and better re-engineering, more customer-centered re-engineering. So it all starts with how are you collecting, clarifying, communicating, and championing customer insights to influence this happening in the company so that we have these results that affect these results that affect these outcomes, right? So that's how I, I, I led customer experience for many years. And it was very influential when I went and made friends with the different people in the, the various non-customer facing groups and showed them what the customers were saying and really caught their attention by quantifying using that type of a template we just looked at. And therefore your metrics need to also show some of these, some of these, 
and some of these levels. If you haven't looked at your metrics in terms of kind of a cascade or a prioritization a dashboard, and you're only looking at the top line, you're really missing out because unless people are seeing how much these are happening and then how much these are happening, they're always going to be pushing at certain things that are take cutting corners and not really addressing the roots. And this is what we call dysfunction in an organization. I call it also Jenga management, where you're kind of taking shortcuts, removing a block in the tower here and throwing it over to the top and making the, the whole uh, uh, tower more wobbly. So it's, it's an expensive way to do business when you're only looking at the top metrics, when you're really pointing out these causes, it helps create more employee satisfaction because there's less crazy stuff happening. So thinking, thinking about employee experience as well, operational gains of customer experience include these things. And if you look at the other side of the coin, we have less churn, longer tenure, lower cost of acquisition, less negative word of mouth among employees and partners. So we need to re, uh, peel this onion again, just like the uh, Russian dolls. So how can we make people more competent quicker? How do we reduce uh, anything that uh, takes away from productivity? Sick days, quiet quitting, so on. How do we minimize silos so that it's easier to do work and less you know, demanding mentally for all of that rigmarole that we end up doing? So let's take it a step level further in order to say what needs to be done about it. How can we make a change? Well, if there was less rework and less duplicated effort, then we could say there's probably going to be better success here and better success here, and therefore better success here, right? More cross-skilling, more collaboration and coordination, charters and job performance that say, how do you impact customers? Why are customers paying for your department and for your job? Helping people see the greater uh, purpose in their role in terms of how is this affecting customers? How do customers appreciate that you're in safety, that you're in legal, that you're in accounts payable, that you're in procurement? Sure, customers are affected by everything, but we aren't pointing it out and it's causing a lot of myopic thinking among employees and therefore not generating that collaboration and so forth, uh, right? So everybody has a lot of uh, silos in their organization. It's just part of how people do. I think there's even silos in families and such. So it's not just about uh, corporate America or something like that. Every place in the world has silos and we need to think even further about how do we affect this? So again, lifetime value of employees. Let's think about how valuable every employee is for their entire career. How can we make things right the first time for our interactions with one another as internal customers and internal suppliers of one another? Because there's always going to be a mirror image of how we treat each other and what our standards are internally to how we play out externally. So having more respect for interdependencies, having more accountability for follow through on what you said, say what you mean and do what you say, and having customer experience performance criteria for every decision and handoff and for reviews at the organization level and the uh, individual level and for approvals. I call these things rituals because they're things that you do in terms of how do you do meetings? What do you put on the agenda? Um, how do you follow up on things? How, how uncomfortable is it when people drop the ball or is it just like, oh, well, you know, it's okay to drop the ball. So I use customer experience insights to help every group, legal, accounting, uh, procurement, uh, quality, uh, facilities, HR, uh, safety, on down the line, including all the business units and account teams and customer touch points uh, uh, as well. But when we're peeling back the onions on our customer insights, we're going to see that 
uh, there are things that we can use to influence this emphasizing trust internally and then also seeing better performance of these metrics, these metrics, and these metrics. So how do I make this happen? I've used this with every single type of functional area in companies with hundreds of groups, and it's magical. Because you put down the problem statement in the customer's words, what is the root cause that you have identified by going through a five whys analysis? Why is this problem statement happening? Now, how do you come up with this? You're looking at that prevalent issue. We just cost it out as being really, you know, too too big to ignore. We need to address it. So you're looking at that uh, prevalent issue and looking at the customer comments associated with it, wherever you can find those comments. Any place in your company that is, that is collecting it, do data mining, voice mining, uh, text mining, and so on. So with the five whys, analysis when you're including someone from HR, someone from sales, someone from a service, someone from engineering or operations, you're having diverse viewpoints in doing the five whys uh, exercise, you will be pretty accurate in that conclusion of the fifth why. So for each fifth why issue, you want to make sure that the action plan matches that. If they don't match, then you've got garbage. Okay. So we want to make sure it matches because that's scientific now. We've gone to the Pareto analysis and then the five whys analysis and then the action plan that matches the fifth why. It's all scientific. So here you're going to be tracking what are you mistake proofing? Uh, that, that's the root cause goal. How are you, what are you going to track here in the root cause as far as we're stopping that? We're, we're reducing the incidence of this root cause. So you're mistake proofing that root cause. Um, so this, you want to have three, uh, uh, three data points for the past, one data point for now, and three data points for your forecast. And this is very effective when you show it in every staff meeting and every ops review, so that the top leaders in the meeting can re remove roadblocks and keep it rolling and maintain accountability, as well as praise for progress made. So we use this uh, extensively, and we put these type of root cause uh, mistake proof goals as what goes into people's bonus, what goes into people's uh, performance reviews and recognition programs. Instead of the survey results, it's extremely more effective than using survey results on people's bonuses and recognition and so forth, because they are controlling this and they're it shows what they're doing about it at the root cause, instead of just slapping more bandages on diseases. So uh, in closing, I just want to show you that you can translate whatever you're doing in savings and gains to financial ratios to speak executives language. So for example, these are the things that we, these are a very small example of hundreds of things that we did using the techniques I've just talked to you about to create what I call experience management annuities. Because when we took this time for customer service by down by 16, it saved customers time, time and resources. That was marketing and sales gold. We could say that type of thing that would really impress customers, show them that we they can trust us, we're there for them, their prosperity is our prosperity, but in turn, it saved us a lot of time. And it also made the money come into the bank quicker and that's what sales velocity is, right? Because we didn't have to do yet another presentation, yet another, another proof point and so on to expand the business or to uh, retain those customers. They wanted to give us their money Therefore, we had increased sales velocity, earnings per share, cumulative average growth rate, return on assets, and so on. So you can use a translation box like that to speak to whatever you're doing. You don't have to actually do the math. You just need to speak to it when you're speaking to, to executives. They may ask you, for examples, my go-to is to say, wonderful, who in finance could I partner with to get a start on that. And I would try to get the finance people to uh, do most of the calculations and such because that's their 
their forte. So what I did in customer experience uh, leadership that really made massive CX gains is we were looking at operational savings and organizational savings at the root cause and what we needed to do in customer insights to uh, collect those stimulating data points for the, these guys to care about it, how we were um, clarifying that to show them, here's here's the, the cause and effect, here are some of the patterns that are going on, how we're communicating that and championing it, hand-holding each group to do their part on the root cause at the bottom level here. And then we were talking about it to the C team in terms of things like earnings per share, return on assets, and so on. So it really connects the dots for people. And you can um, report things in terms of how many remedial costs were stopped, how much budget was freed up, how, how many resources did you redeploy? How did you free up customers to do more with their time? Add up all of that, and that's the value of your customer experience savings. I wanna thank you for joining me today be thinking about these ways that we just talked about as your untapped opportunities for your CX strategy. You can join me every week uh, for mastermind sessions. We're taking templates like we just talked about today and actually working them through in a 90 minute session. Um, there's a lot of different ways that Clear Action does this and the experience value exchange is one other place where templates and other hands-on opportunities are there to put into practice all of the things that are on the CCXP blueprint that are at these various levels of fundamental, intermediate, expert, and executive. So just bringing it all to life in terms of the real uh, best practices, we'd say maybe superior practices compared to current commonly practiced best practices. Okay, so I'll send you the presentation if you attend it here or if you request it. Be glad to send you that and let's keep the conversation going. You can contact me by email or direct message on LinkedIn or WhatsApp. Thanks for joining Thanks. me today. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Celia, Brian, everyone here. See you later. <laughs>